Hi everyone, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Tal, Tal Melamed. I'm the head of security uh, research at uh, Protigo Labs, um, Israeli based startup for serverless security. And today we're going to talk about serverless top 10. Um, so before I start, about me, you can read about me uh, online. If you want to follow me, use one of those. I'm working at a company called Protigo. Uh, we do a serverless uh, security solution. Of course, if it interests you, come back after the talk. Well, two talks. After this talk, you are all invited to the project showcase where I have another talk. Um, so, what are we going to talk today? Uh, intro, usually I give about 10, 15 minutes intro about serverless uh, because it's a relatively new technology, but I don't have time for that, so I'll make it short, uh, just to make you understand what are cloud functions, and then we'll dive into the top 10. Um, so, first, before reInvent, AWS uh, latest reInvent, no one knew what serverless is. Uh, usually, this is the first question that um, people ask me after I tell them, yeah, I do serverless security, and they say, server what? Um, so after the talk, after the reInvent, people start noticing it, um, and you can see most of the talk were about serverless, and after that, security, uh, which is interesting because if I go to Google Trend and I look at serverless, you can see it's a constant uh, increase over time. Yeah, people hear more and more about serverless, they want to participate, but if I do uh, serverless security, which is what we're interesting in, interested in, there's um, nothing. Uh, maybe one, but that's me. Uh, <laughs> so we're not really there yet in the security. People will start understanding after they're getting hacked, like always, like with every new technology. Oh, mobile. We don't need new security, right? Oh, sorry. Um, but it's a thing, and how do I know? Because this is from uh, last night. Palo Alto just acquired our competitors, uh, so raises also our value, so that's uh, also good. So people are starting to understand that serverless is a, is a thing. And uh, uh, how do I know that as well? Uh, is because uh, all the major companies are doing serverless, providing that service. So Azure, AWS, GCP, Google, uh, SAP, IBM, you name it. The big ones are going serverless. So what are serverless? What is serverless exactly? Just this is the only intro that you'll get about serverless. If you want, do some homework after that. Um, so serverless is just giving you compute uh, powers on the cloud. So I'll, I'll mention, usually I'll say AWS because they rule the market, but I mean every service provider. Uh, so for example, when you want to run your code, your application, um, a container spins up in the cloud. You do not have to deal with anything related to that container, and it's, it's like a standard container that is built in for, for, your, for any of of uh, the functions. So this container runs your code, and when, it's, uh, when the code ends and finishes its execution, the container dies. Um, uh, there, it's not con completely true, maybe we'll talk about it later. So it only spins up when required, and you pay only for what you use. It is triggered by events, so it does not have to be what we were used to in the monolithic application, API call, code runs, back we get the, the output. It doesn't have to be like that. Um, the, the power of serverless is that functions can be triggered from various uh, of um, different uh, uh, events like uploading file, modifying a database uh, table, um, time-based like a cron job or something like that. It could, could MQTT, IoT, you name it. So it's not only API. Um, it's a read-only environment. Uh, except from the slash temp, so everything else is read-only and uh, you cannot uh, modify it. So you only have the slash temp library. Uh, it, so I said the container terminates uh, when uh, code finishes its execution. Um, they are not wired to the internet, so you cannot SSH to the, to the containers. Um, 
The data is temporary, so again, when the uh, container ends its cycle, they shut down, everything that was there under the slash temp is deleted. Um, we'll talk about these wild asterisks after that. Uh, the code is inside the environment, so when the container spins up, it has the code there, so it knows what to execute. And also the keys that gives the function uh, its abilities in the cloud are also there, and we'll abuse some of those during the talk. Uh, so I'm here to introduce the OWASP serverless top 10. So the current state of the project is an interpretation of the original OWASP top 10 2017. We are running an open dat data call. You are, if you are using um, serverless, that you're more than welcome to contribute. Um, of course, it's an OWASP, OWASP project, so it's open. Uh, so currently, we have a report that is the interpretation of the OS, original OS top 10, but the goal is to have a serverless tailored top 10. Uh, we also have a Chinese uh, translation. Thanks for, where are you? Uh, yeah, hey. Uh, so we have a, trans, a Chinese translation from, the, uh, from OS China for, the, for this project. Okay, uh, GIF doesn't work, let's go. So let's dive, I don't have much time. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go over each of the top 10 so I don't have much time and we're gonna see and I'm, we're gonna talk about why it's different and what do we, how, how do we need to, uh, to deal with it. So injections, why are injections on serverless are different than injection uh, attacks on a regular uh, application? Uh, first, uh, there is no API input, com not only API input coming in, you cannot put your barriers there, there is no firewall you can put, it's not yours. So you have, basically in serverless, it's code centric, so it's only AppSec, which is why it's a very good to uh, topic at OWASP. So there are various of entry points for your code, for your functions, your application logic, that can come from multiple events. So this is why we refer to it as an event injection rather than uh, what we're used to. Uh, the traditional injections still apply, SQL injection, if you use SQL in the cloud, uh, no SQL, if you use um, other uh, NoSQL no databases. Command injection, it works if you have a vulnerable code, but what you can do on the server is different. So for example, you don't have remote code execution or serverless, uh, server hijacking because there is no server. So we'll see how it works differently. Um, so you can, you have per language, uh, of course, uh, code injection because functions run with different languages. So most common one, like 80% um, is a Python and Node. Um, currently you can also have C Sharp, especially if you use Azure. Uh, okay. And uh, there are some new methods of injecting, uh, of, of injection attacks that come through different types of event. They weren't actually there or weren't very common in the regular app, which is, for example, MQTT, injection through emails, uh, um, notifications, and different various of events coming in. Uh, of course, the impact, and we'll get to that later in the top 10, the impact that you can do uh, through an injection depends on what the function can do. Uh, so the, the ability to, or, well, it can be both a liability and uh, uh, an opportunity that um, you have to give, or it depends also on the service provider, but you, you can give different permissions for different functions. So if you think about it from the AppSec world, it's a dream, right? If you could take an application and give different permissions for each function inside the, your PHP code or whatever, it, it could be, a, it's a least privileged dream. So in serverless, it also, uh, it's actually possible because you can actually give, or in some providers you, you have to provide different permissions. So the injection uh, impact, it depends on the uh, uh, permissions or what the uh, capabilities of the function. Uh, so if before we had an attacker coming in through the also, um, 
uh, only perimeter. Now on serverless, it can be through an API gateway, of course, but it can be also through different various uh, different types of events. So there is no here. You can put your security controls, right, and everything goes through it. But you don't own anything that that goes in. You have only the code that runs when an event hits. Let's see a demo. Again, I wanted to show a live demo, but we're short in time, so we'll settle for uh, we'll settle for a video injection. Yep. Uh, no. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, okay, so we have a Slack uh, Slack chatbot here that interacts with me writing messages. Uh, yeah, but it's also vulnerable to SQL injection, uh, to injection, sorry, not SQL. It's also vulnerable to um, injection attack through a vulnerable library. So if you see, saw a snake, it was a good continuance to, for that. So I am doing now required child process. So what I'm going to do here is I'm gonna execute a child process within the function. And I'm going to send this to this my address at Angrok, uh, the simple HTTP tunnel here. Uh, a curl, through curl. So yeah, I got that. That request came from the container, from the Lambda function. Or, sorry, in this case it's a Lambda function. It could be also a, a cloud function, Azure function, or whatever provider. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to use the same technique, uh, but now instead of just sending uh, slash hack with nothing, I'm going to take the slash, uh, sorry, I'm going to uh, archive the dot slash library, which is where the code is, and then uh, write it into a, um, a tar file under slash temp, because it's the only location where I can write it to, and then when I shoot that request up, you can see that I got the source here. Looking through my ungrub. Yeah, I wrapped it in base64 so I can get it as an HTML. I'm going to just decode that. Very slowly. I got all the packages and the code index.js, so on, only left for me is to look inside the uh, index.js, and I got the source code of the function running on the backend, on the uh, application. So I cannot really run uh, code shell on the server because there is no server, but I can still code, and I can steal that, and now I can investigate that. I cut that because we don't have time. I can see everything that goes here, and then continue my attacks, of course, to steal some more sensitive information. All right. Crap, I lost one second. We don't need that. Okay. <coughs> okay, two, broken authentication. Again, this is very brief. We don't have much time to go through 10. Um, so you can, after the talk, of course, go to the, the documentation and read more C do, uh, examples. Uh, broken authentication. So the functions are stateless. If you, if you think about how it works, when the container spins up and the function starts running, it doesn't have anything that it's built in. There is no session or something like that. You have to take care of that by yourself. So the functions are stateless. They don't know what's going on before or after. So you have to take care of that. Again, multiple entry points, services, events, and triggers can cause a broken authentication because if you're thinking about, okay, it's an API gateway, I'll put everything there. But not all your code will run through API gateway. In fact, uh, according to our customers, about 70%, uh, rough, roughly, are going through API gateway. 30% of the traffic is not coming through API gateway. That means that putting the authentication there won't work for, for all cases. And in fact, we saw that with some customers that were assuming that if the request or that the function is triggered outside of the API uh, gateway, no one really uh, is, able, is going to be able to attack it. But that was not true, not the case. You could attack through different uh, events. 
So, for example, there, this is a scenario where um, you can um, use your code commits and uh, code control over, uh, for example, this AWS. Uh, you can go use the, some, uh, the code commit service and it sends an automatic notification to the, uh, to the manager to go to review the code and once the manager um, approves the code, there is a Lambda function that do, does something into the um, integrations or whatever we want. But if we do not protect also these parts, uh, a malicious uh, user can just send an email. Yeah, you, of course, you have to learn something about th the environment to, to be able to attack, but we know that's possible. Right? You're a security, we're a security conference. I don't have to preach that. So um, an attacker can just send an email that will trigger an SES, um, an email event that will trigger the function. So that's bypassing the authentication. Okay, uh, sensitive data exposure. So um, it's the same as any cloud um, risk. Well, of course, if you are in the cloud, there is the risk, although it's not really a risk anymore. I'm trusting um, Azure and AWS. I'm trusting you more than I trust other, my, my own, I don't know, DevOps or something to store the data, so. Um, but the risks are the same. Uh, the things that what you are going to target are different. So the data that the application um, interacts with or creating or the, um, modifying is always stored in one location. It's the slash temp because any data that you want to process has to get there because it's the only right uh, folder. So if you have access to the function through injections or whatever, you want to steal that data out of the slash temp. Now before I said it's going to be terminated when the once the function is uh, ends its execution, but that is not completely true. They have something for uh, performance where they recycle containers if there is enough requests. So you can actually keep old containers alive if you keep uh, requesting uh, more and more uh, scaling the data, so, uh, scaling the application. So you can keep the data uh, to remain, uh, and you can still, sorry, you can still customer data. Um, environment variables uh, in the environment also contain sensitive data, and we'll see that uh, later. So actually the keys for the function, the session keys, what the function can actually do in the environment, uh, in, the, in the cloud, is stored there, uh, so also that you can steal. Sensitive data in open buckets and open blobs and uh, any uh, storage, cloud storage that you do not configure correctly will uh, end up. And we've seen, in, we've seen in the news, you can look, at, look it up, uh, many buckets are just open. And I don't have time, there is a website called uh, Gray Warfare, I think, something like that. It's, it's the showdown of buckets. So you can go there and start ex uh, exploring buckets. You can, you can uh, if you want fake passports, go there. Um, there is really everything there. You can find government files open and uh, any uh, company that stores data in the, in, the, in the cloud. Sometimes they leave it open. Um, the source code we already saw. So the source code is also located in the environment, so you should be aware of that. Stealing uh, keys, so if you want and on AWS to get the keys, you just type env, so it's uh, like, so if you have execute, instead of stealing the source code, I can just type env, get all the uh, keys here, you can see session token and the access ID key and uh, every, all, all that I need is there. So w if I have this, I can, from my own computer at home, I can uh, communicate or um, interact with the cloud of the, prov of the, of the company. So well, I've, it's enough that I'm, I have access to one function then I can do whatever this function can do from my own computer. I don't have to interact with the function anymore. I just st uh, store those on my computer and then I use uh, API calls directly to the server. Okay, stealing function keys. Uh, we just saw that, so I have the keys, I stole the keys, 
Now all I have to do is AWS, this is an example, AWS, DynamoDB, list tables, with those keys, this is from my computer at home. And I can get all the, uh, all the tables in the, in the company's, uh, they, um, yeah, in the company's uh, cloud account. Again, depends on the permissions. A4, XML, XXC. Um, so it's going to be the same. I don't have to, to explain more about XXC. The only difference is that this is code that we found in, the, in GitHub. It exists. So it exists. Um, so the only difference, if we were used to do something like that, let's see, password was our uh, crown uh, jewel. We don't need that anymore. In fact, this file is useless because it's a regular template file on the container. So what we can do or want to do is something like that, which will give us the source code. So the attack is the same. What we need to steal or what, where we need to steal the data from is different. Uh, broken access control. So th this is a major problem, maybe the biggest problem today. Functions are overprivileged because no one is able to actually go through 5,000 uh, different actions that the function is able to do manually and select the correct ones. Of course, you'll, you'll have to automate that, but uh, what we see 98% of all the thousands and thousand functions that we, uh, we saw, 98% have overprivileged, some of them critical, some of them lower, but let's take an example, again from AWS, sorry the other providers. Um, so this is a simple code that reads, file from, reads a file from the cloud storage. So the developer, uh, the, the manager tells the developer, go give me the permissions for the function. And he, does, he goes to the documentation on aws.com and he gets this one. This one works because it allows the, the developer to do whatever he wants. So any action on F3 and any resource on F3, th that works. But what's the problem? It's the security. It means that if the function is compromised, the attacker can do whatever he wants on any F3 bucket in the, in the cloud account. So he goes and does, does some more research and he comes up with this. Okay, whatever action you can do, the function can do, but only on this specific bucket. That narrows it down, the attack, attack surface. But if you can do that uh, automatically maybe, or maybe you have a genius developer, then you can come, or a security team that is very good, you can come up with this, which tells you that the function now can only do get object from the database. So yes, it can be vulnerable. Yes, you can still get uh, an object from the database, from the, sorry, so the cloud storage, but that is all you can do. And quickly, we're gonna see the second and last video for. Well, that's a surprise. So I have a function that is vulnerable to command injection. Yeah, 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 we don't have time. So you can see here that what the function has in the permissions is uh, F3, whatever, whatever, um, wildcard, wildcard. So now I can uh, do some, uh, with the stolen keys, of course, some upload to, to, the, to a cloud storage. Now. I'm going to attack the function and still list all the objects in, in another bucket because I can do whatever I want in the account. How much time? Okay. And I got the request, all the objects in the bucket. Now I'm going to do, quickly, quickly, I'm going to change that to F3 put object only and only, sorry, and only on this specific bucket. And now I'm going to do the same attacks over uh, deploy the function, of course, again. Yay. And then I'm gonna run the same attacks. You can see that it works, it, it does the put object, but now when I do the list uh, objects from the database, it's not gonna work because the function cannot do that. It's not that the attacker is not able to do the same attack, it's just the function is blocked by the provider. So that's, that's a good thing, that if you can do that. Okay, security configurations, again, open buckets, uh, permissions, uh, things like that uh, can cause uh, timeouts, can cause denial of service or denial of wallet. If you have too much timeout, can cause denial of service. If you give the function to uh, um, uh, lower concurrency, 
uh, abilities, it can cause also uh, denial of service or denial of wallet if you allow too much. We're gonna skip that demo. Cross-site scripting, again, it's the same attack coming from locations where you, you weren't expecting. So it can come from an SCS, um, from an email. If you'll join me at the, at the DVSA talk later after this one, I'll show you a cross-site scripting coming from an email. So it's gonna be cool. This serialization is also the same, but we're gonna target, sorry, different locations. So the deserialization will target here, uh, env. And then I'm gonna get the keys from the Lambda function into my computer and uh, do that myself. Five minutes, great. Uh, vulnerable dependencies. So you heard, maybe some of you uh, heard the sneak talk. This becomes a really uh, problem, a real problem in our um, era. Uh, in serverless, it even, uh, it's even, um, it even increases. Why? Because the functions are that, usually that small, are uh, usually a type of microservices architecture and you give the function a specific action that you want it to do, and this is it. So in order to be able to do that specific action, it needs to bring up a bunch of dependencies. So usually what we, you will see in cloud functions is a lot of imports and then 100 lines of code. This is a, a typical function. So it's very common to come up with a vulnerable dependency. And, uh, sorry, and of course, all the examples that I showed you, or some of them and some that I'll show next, are going are due to vulnerable dependencies that brought your function some vulnerabilities. So even if you think your line, 100 lines of codes are okay, you still have thousands of lines of code that coming with them that might, might break your uh, application down. Uh, insufficient logging and monitoring. So uh, different from containers where you have to inspect and know what's in there, in the container, you, you, you get what you use or you get what you want. So if you want to interact with the service, you just talk to the service, you don't have anything that you don't know about. So that's a good thing, but you also have to create your own uh, logging and monitoring. Well, they, they, you have it in the cloud account, but you have to inspect the services to know what's going on in your account. So if you just leave your functions to run, they will run, but you won't know what happens in your application because you cannot put anything in the network level. You, you, go, you have to go to the provider's logging uh, resources and start filtering, so it's, it's difficult. How do you find security events? It's difficult. So you have to uh, come up with a plan to do that. Plus, you're gonna see millions and millions of invocations if you have a, a production account uh, to each of the functions, so you won't be able, it will be hard to understand what's going on. Can that be real complex? Yes, so this is an architecture of a serverless function. Each of them has a different function and resource. They become one application, but individu they are individuals, and you have to monitor each one um, separately. Uh, so yeah, we created uh, OS DVSA, the vulnerable serverless application. It's also an open source, Twitter, and uh, live version. Uh, it is now in the one, well, now right after this talk, I'm gonna run there so you can join me. It's just a vulnerable, the first real world uh, vulnerable serverless application. It's a working serverless with uh, ecom uh, flows that you can, they're all 100% serverless that you can hack and fix. Um, that's it, thank you. Thank you very much for joining me.